Hi, this is Matt Baker. Welcome to episode 6 in my series on who wrote the Bible. We're currently working our way through the New Testament, which has a total of 27 books. Last time we talked about the four Gospels, as well as the book of Acts. So in this episode, we're going to look at the next 21 books, which are all known as epistles. The word epistle simply meaning a letter. 14 of these books have at some point been attributed to the Apostle Paul and are therefore known as the Pauline epistles. The other seven are attributed to other early Christian leaders and are therefore known as the general or Catholic epistles, the word Catholic simply meaning wide-ranging. We can further divide the Pauline epistles into three categories. The first nine are letters written to specific churches, whereas the next four are written to individual people. That leaves Hebrews, which is usually considered on its own, as it is the only one of the Pauline epistles which is now almost universally recognized to have been not written by Paul. So we've got a lot to cover. Let's get to it. So we're going to start with the nine letters written by Paul to specific churches. All nine of these letters start with the exact same word, Paul. Nowadays, when a person writes a letter, they usually start with dear so-and-so. In other words, they start with the recipient's name. However, when it comes to the New Testament epistles, we get the opposite. The letters always start with the sender's name first, then the recipient, and then usually some kind of personal greeting. Let's first take a look at a map to see the locations where each of these letters were sent. Romans, of course, was sent to Rome which is the most familiar location on the list. First and second Corinthians were sent to Corinth, Corinth being one of the major cities in Greece. Galatians was sent to Galatia. Galatia is the only place name on this list that is not a city. It refers to an entire region located right in the middle of Anatolia, what is today Turkey. We then get Ephesians, which was sent to the city of Ephesus on the coast of Anatolia. Next, Philippians, sent to Philippi, a city in ancient Macedonia, named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip. Colossians was sent to the city of Colossae, yet another city in Anatolia. Finally, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were sent to Thessaloniki, which is in the same region as Philippi. Now, this series is called Who Wrote the Bible? So, the main question we need to answer is, did Paul actually write these letters? As we've seen throughout this series, the person who is claimed in the text, or by tradition, to be the author, is actually, usually, not the author. For example, according to most modern scholars, Moses did not actually write the five books of Moses. Solomon did not write the Song of Solomon. And Matthew probably didn't even write the Gospel of Matthew. It may therefore surprise you when I say that, according to most scholars, even the most secular critical ones, Paul did in fact write most of these letters. There is some disagreement over Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians, but the rest, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, and 1st Thessalonians are pretty much universally recognized as being the genuine works of Paul. How do scholars make distinctions like this? Well, it mostly boils down to style. The six epistles thought to be genuine all share a very similar writing style, similar vocabulary, similar grammar, and similar ideas. The other three stand out as being different. Now, this could indicate that Paul simply used an assistant to write these letters, or that he wrote them at a later date, or when he was in a very different mood. Like I say, scholars are divided on this. But for those who have doubts, these three are considered pseudepigrapha, meaning that they were probably written several decades after Paul's death by someone pretending to be Paul. 
As we've seen in previous episodes, it was not uncommon in ancient times for writers to do something like this. In the last episode, I used this timeline. As I mentioned then, Paul was not actually a follower of Jesus during Jesus' lifetime. He became a Christian after Jesus' death, sometime in the 30s CE. And he lived up until the 60s, when he was killed during the reign of Emperor Nero. The genuine Pauline epistles can therefore all be placed within the range of his ministry. Generally, Galatians and 1 Thessalonians are thought to have been the earliest letters, both dating to around the year 50, with Romans and the two Corinthians being written sometime during the late 50s, and Philippians coming last, usually being placed in the early 60s. The other letters, if they are indeed pseudepigrapha, can probably be placed around the end of the first century or early in the second century, which means that Galatians and 1 Thessalonians are the two earliest books in the entire New Testament, and that all of the genuine Pauline epistles were written prior to the four Gospels, which is an important point when it comes to the study of the historical Jesus. Skeptics have pointed out the fact that the Pauline epistles contain zero references to biographical details about the life of Jesus, other than his death and supposed resurrection. For example, Paul never mentions Mary or any of Jesus' other family members, not even in passing. He also never mentions Bethlehem or Nazareth, nor does he ever refer to even a single one of Jesus' parables, sermons, exorcisms, healings, or other miracles. This is a bit strange, and skeptics use it to argue that Jesus was primarily a legendary figure, if not an entirely fictional one. However, believers counter these arguments with the fact that Paul's letters were, well, letters, and the purpose of the letters were to explain theology, not to list facts about Jesus, facts that the recipients of the letters would already have known. Let's now move on to the four letters that Paul is said to have written to individual people. These are called the pastoral epistles, and when it comes to the pastoral epistles, only one is universally recognized as being genuine. That one is Philemon. Again, this mostly boils down to style. Philemon very much matches the style of the six letters we've already labeled as genuine. So, that brings us to a total of seven genuine Pauline epistles. At least 50% of biblical scholars feel that the other three pastoral epistles, Titus and the two Timothys, are pseudepigrapha, which, again, would place them much later on the timeline. Which brings us to Hebrews. Virtually no biblical scholar today attributes this one to Paul, even in the most conservative circles. In fact, this letter doesn't even begin with the usual Paul at the top. No sender is mentioned, nor any recipient, although at the end it says those from Italy send their greetings. But the book is called Hebrews because it is thought that it was sent to Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. So, this is yet another book for the anonymous category. However, there have been numerous hypotheses put forward over the years as to who the author might be. One hypothesis that I find quite interesting is that it was written by a woman named Priscilla. If true, this would be very notable. You probably noticed that, so far, it seems that the Bible was written entirely by men which is not too surprising considering that, as a whole, female authors were pretty rare in the ancient world. However, before we talk about Priscilla, I should point out that there is also the possibility that some female authors contributed toward the Tanakh, or Old Testament. As we saw in previous episodes, many of the books in that part of the Bible are actually anonymous and consist of several different texts combined together. It is therefore possible, if not probable, that at least one psalm or other piece of text was written by an anonymous woman. 
In fact, I've even seen one scholar claim that the J source for the Torah might have had a female author. But back to Priscilla. Priscilla and her husband Aquila are mentioned six times in the New Testament as being early Christian leaders and good friends of Paul. In fact, it seems that Priscilla in particular might have held some kind of prominent rank in the early church. It seems that early on, men and women were treated equally in Christian circles, and only later did the church become more patriarchal. If Hebrews was written by a woman, it might explain why it eventually ended up being recorded as being anonymous. Anyway, like I said, this is just a hypothesis and is by no means the mainstream position. All that we really know is that Hebrews is written in very polished Greek and that it is the most carefully composed and eloquent book in the entire New Testament. This all makes it very hard to date, so I'm simply going to go with the standard estimate, which is somewhere between 70 and 100. Okay, that brings us to the seven general epistles. The first one is attributed to someone named James, usually thought to be James, the brother of Jesus, and the initial leader of the church in Jerusalem. For a discussion of the various individuals in the New Testament named James, of which there were several, check out the video that we did on the family tree of Jesus. The Epistle of James is actually one of the books that almost didn't make it into the New Testament. For this and other reasons, most scholars feel that this is probably yet another example of pseudepigrapha. In other words, it was either written by someone pretending to be James, the brother of Jesus, or by some less important guy who happened to be named James. Likewise, 1st and 2nd Peter were probably not written by Peter, the leader of the Twelve Apostles. In fact, based on the styles used, the two epistles attributed to Peter were probably written by two different people. And in the case of 2nd Peter, it looks like the author may have copied a bit from Jude, who we'll get to in a second. One of the arguments against authorship by Peter is the fairly safe assumption that Peter was an illiterate fisherman. Now, the counter-argument is that Peter could have learned to write later on, or that he could have used a secretary. However, Peter's writing skills are not the only problem. The letters simply do not come across as being written by someone who knew Jesus personally, which Peter did. They come across as being written by people who were highly learned with expert-level knowledge of the Septuagint and other ancient writings. Next up is the three letters attributed to John, traditionally thought to be the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. But unlike all the other epistles, except for Hebrews, these three letters don't actually start with the name of the sender although letters 2 and 3 do start with the words, the elder. As I mentioned in the episode on the Gospels, the Apostle John probably didn't write the Gospel of John. However, it is likely that whoever did write the Gospel of John also wrote the three epistles of John. The styles are similar enough to assume a single author for all four works, so probably someone that was a member of the hypothetical Johannine community. The last epistle is the epistle of Jude, said in the text itself to be the brother of James. Traditionally, this would mean that Jude was also the brother of Jesus. Like the epistle of James, the epistle of Jude was one of those books that almost didn't make the cut. Therefore, the assumption is that it is probably pseudepigrapha. Which means that, according to most scholars, none of the general epistles are genuine letters from the people who were said to have written them. This is in contrast to the Pauline epistles, seven of which, as we have seen, are in fact genuine. So, all of the general epistles can probably be placed on the timeline somewhere late in the first century or early second. Now, before I go, I want to mention one more epistle that almost made it into the New Testament, but was eventually cut out. The Epistle of Barnabas. 
Barnabas was a traveling companion of Paul, but as you can probably guess, the epistle of Barnabas was in all likelihood not written by the real Barnabas. It's yet another example of pseudepigrapha. Now, why other pseudepigrapha made it into the New Testament, but this one did not, is uncertain. For the first few centuries of the Common Era, it was in fact included alongside other books like James and Jude. But like I say, eventually it was dropped. Two other books that were dropped are The Shepherd of Hermas and The Didache. Neither are epistles, but I thought they were worth mentioning since I won't be doing a separate episode on the New Testament Apocrypha. The Shepherd of Hermas is comprised of various visions, commandments, and proverbs, whereas the Didache is kind of like an early catechism, a catechism being a summary of Christian doctrine used for teaching. So the only book in the New Testament left to discuss is the Book of Revelation. Also, when covering the Old Testament, I skipped the Book of Daniel. So the final episode in this series, Episode 7, will cover both Daniel and Revelation. I decided to talk about these two books together because their content is similar and because they are both examples of apocalyptic literature. To find the full list of episodes in this series, check out the links in the description. Thanks for watching.